first of all, I think your analysis was very straight line. The street doesn't run in a straight line. Kid, you cannot tell your neighbor he is stealing ducks when you are stealing funds. As High Commissioner, I was wrong. As Charandas Prasad, I reacted naturally how any person would have. I did not come here for food for that kind of food. I did not come here for that kind of abuse. If you're going to go along that road, I'll walk off. But it's all okay once they're talking. If they were talking, I could not have been here today. You got ADA, mm -hmm. ADHD. I yes, got I that don't. thing. Oh, no, calm down, down, calm down. I think I've done enough in terms of taking our team um, out of trouble from losing. Come on, Lord Taylor. You got, you got that's good. I'm reading the script now, and the first person that comes to my mind to play a detective, yes, but an erratic detective, Mickey Rodriguez. Why you not freaking supper in young? Why a man and supper woman? Look, you deal with that. You deal with that. We must encourage platforms like this because it brings together different people and allows for discussions. To, to take place in our country on a multiplicity of fundamental issues. Uh, Kingdom, you apologizing for no, something no, 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 you think no, no. I did is wrong. I don't no, no. want you to do that and you should not have done that. whatever it is that you're doing i hope that you're driving safely also and that you are enjoying us as usual it's been one year since we came into being kildari fred kisun show and what a year it has been a uh, learning experience of myself and of course we had many interesting guests and we talking it as it is trying to educate you try to go back a little in history but also talk a little bit current events in our country as we go forward, forward with this country, country. I've always said it and Freddie has said it too. We have to analyze the situation and see maybe make correspond, uh, corresponding um, analysis to what is happening around the world and see whether those are the best practices. Um, uh, as always, I don't want to waste any time today. There's a lot of things going on, but two incidents uh, in particular I think I should raise with you. We have too many fires in this country and too many times we've seen uh, uh, people being burned to death and it really breaks my heart. Um, a catastrophe seems to have been prevented us about two days back. A uh, prisoner in the Brigdam police station found, he says, that's what he says, found uh, um, a lighter and some toilet paper and he decided to light it to ward off the mosquitoes. And it almost caused another fire at the Brigdam police station. Across the Nessa um a fisherman was burnt up in his house. We'll have to talk to the fire chief sometime or the other. Many, many houses in Guyana, many properties in Guyana, has wiring that goes back uh, decades, decades, and nobody checks it. When a breaker goes, you replace it. You ever think to yourself that maybe uh, those, there's a problem that caused a breaker to trip? There's always a problem. GPL will tell you that. The officials they will tell you that. Whatever it is, let us pay a little more care. Let us pay attention to our surroundings. And, of course, when it comes to having an escape route so within our house, back door, front door, it's important that we have a, a an emergency plan. Tonight, I want to say good night to Freddie Kisun, my co-host as always. And he is going to introduce our guest, no stranger to this country, no stranger to politics, and so somebody who has years and years of experience in the legal field. It's always good to talk to him. Freddie Kisun. Welcome to the Gildari Freddie Kisun Show, wherever you are, uh, whichever part of the world, thanks for being here. Our guest this evening, like many others in Guyana, need no introduction. A man with a very long history, as long as the Essequibo River of political experience. And tonight, we're going to add to Guyana's historiography because what is interesting 
with people with experience is that they fill gaps that if we don't have them, those gaps are left unfilled and history suffers. So what the valuable insight that these experienced actors and patriots bring to Guyana historiography is expanding it. We are left wondering and we'll never know about these gaps if experienced actors and prominent politicians and prominent lawyers, engineers, doctors, if they don't fill these gaps, then history remains incomplete. We've had the latest book by a politician in Guyana, um, From Destiny to Prosperity by Rafael Trotman. And he raised some issues in that book, which we will ask our experienced guests tonight to talk about. So the man who needs no introduction has been a longtime leader in the, PN, in the PPP's hierarchy. He has been the Speaker of the National Assembly, and he is one of the leading attorneys in Guyana still practicing. He has graced our studios before, and seminal questions were left unanswered because an hour just runs. So we will make sure we capture historical moments before the hour goes. Our guest this evening is famous politician, lawyer, and prominent citizen of Guyana, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran. Ralph, thanks for being here again. I'd like to start off with uh, the screaming headline from the um, Starbuck News, which is taken from your piece of the conversation tree, which is run every week by Starbuck, in which you say the criminal justice system is near the abyss. That's putting it my way. And you go on to describe the length of time people spend on remand, the length of time for civil cases to be um, brought to fruition, the, um, the bail system, um, all kinds of not pleasant things that characterize the rule of law. Um, would you like to expand? Well, thank you for having me uh, once again, gentlemen. Um, I'm maybe as probably not as old as the Escribo River, but I'm certainly not as mighty as the Escribo River. Um, maybe should let other people decide that. <laughs> The criminal justice system had been ailing for a very long time. And because prisoners spend a long time in jail, the Constitution says that they're, uh, they're entitled to uh, a, a, a trial within re a fair, fair and fair trial within reasonable time. Now, reasonable time, I suppose, has been interpreted in different ways. It hasn't been, ever been interpreted in Guyana by, the, by a, a court. But I remember about two decades ago, it was interpreted to be eight months in Canada. Now, Guyana is not Canada, and probably a court in Guyana might give reasonable time, a, a, a longer interval. But prisoners frequently spend three, four years before they get a trial, and that is certainly not reasonable time. And those people are not, uh, they're being wrongfully held for such a long period of time. And what happened recently was three judges retired. Justice Holder, Justice um, Reynolds, and Justice, um, the, the lady judge. Uh, um, no, um, Diane Insanali. Mm -hmm. So three judges retired. There were 10 judges and seven remained. Now, they, they, you just have to, you can't get your matters heard. Um, people, not I'm not talking about lawyers, I'm talking about people's issues are not being resolved in a civil field. Criminal field, you have about two judges doing criminal trials and it's just not enough. Uh, and that is what triggered the article. There was a conference which, um, which I fo fo based the article on. Thankfully, the president has appointed the Judicial Service Commission and hopefully we will see the the judiciary being expanded, both the Court of Appeal, 
which takes six years to try a matter. I just want to note that the judges are all working very hard, but there are just not enough of them. So hopefully we'll see the full complement of seven judges in the Court of Appeal and as near a complement as possible of 20 judges in the High Court to get our um, systems moving. Um, what had been happening is it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that we have have not had a judicial service commission for seven years. I, I This is totally unbelievable. I mean, I don't know how a country can accept a situation like that. And that is what angered me. I have written about it several times. And that last article where I said that the, the authorities are not listening and do not care was written in just total exasperation because the Judicial Service Commission was not being appointed. Thankfully, it has now been appointed, and hopefully we will see a movement in that direction. Well, Mr. Ram Karana, that's a very, very important point. I, I tell you, I'm going to draw some parallels. I went into a state agency recently to collect a registration, and within three hours, I joined four lines. And I couldn't understand uh, this agency which collect billions of dollars or is tasked with collecting billions of dollars in revenues every year could not put enough persons there to 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 conduct a very um uh, a very pertinent a very important function of collecting people documents of collecting monies and give a service to the people. You spoke about a compliment. Is there a quota when it comes to the number of judges and magistrates um, within our court system? There is a there is a quota. We I don't think we have never we have ever had more than twelve judges sitting at the same time, <clears throat> but you can have up to twenty judges. So they can appoint up to twenty judges, and if they go close to twenty, we've had twelve. If they go to fifteen judges, you will see a marked difference in this in speedy trials. Um, and if they have the full seven of in the Court of Appeal, where you can have two courts sitting at the same time, the Court of Appeal is usually three judges. You can have five judges sitting, but normally three judges sit. So you can have two judges, two courts going on simultaneously. And that backlog, backlog that is in the Court of Appeal um, will vanish. I think we should take some of these things. You know, you know how they would feel it, and Freddie, and this is something you could probably write about. The one of them are the relatives end up in the court system and had and and is lingering in jail like a uh, woman Mr. Ram Grant said for a couple of years, then you would really feel it at, at the doorstep. It is impossible that you would see something lingering. Imagine for seven years no JSC. Seven years, Freddie? Um, well, you are known equally for the law as you're known for politics. I wonder there may be a disagreement in that, whether you're known more for politics than the law. But I want to swing to politics and then we're going to come back with this abolition of the jury system that you seem to favor. But let's talk about politics. Mr. Ramkaran, is it your opinion or not that if after the 2011 election, Mr. Ramatar lost uh, a majority. In 2015, he lost. Do you think the result would have been different in 2015 if Mr. Ramatar did not run back? I think the PVP was severely damaged by 2011, and that is why they lost the election. The PVP did not understand it. They did not realize it. They did not analyze it sufficiently but they were very damaged in 2011 and if they had a new candidate in in, in 2012 i don't know who that candidate 2015. 2015 i don't know who that candidate they could potentially have have won but it would have taken a great effort to um to to win those elections in 2011 the, the, the cru critical mistake the PPP made between 2011 and 2015 was to allow the coalition between the AFC and the APU to build. They allowed that coalition to build. And if they had done something to stop the coalition from building, they could have won the elections. And the way to stop that coalition from building was to join with the AFC, uh, bring the AFC into 
in, in, into play on their side and then call an, uh, an other elections. But at that time, you were out of the loop. Um, in, I was out of the loop. I was, um, I, 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 in 2011, I was, um, I didn't campaign in 2011, but I supported the, the uh, PPP in those elections. But in 2012, I was, I, I left. I left the PPP in 2012. I wasn't in the loop between 2012 and 2015 so i had no say in the but i made I, I made public remarks from time to time you know i went i was invited to speak in new york and they to a, 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 an event in new york and they um the speech got a great deal of publicity in guyana and the german elections had just taken place um and they were negotiating between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats in Germany. These are the two big parties, as you know. They were negotiating for a coalition government. So I said, how can we have in 2011 a minority government in Guyana all over Europe? You have coalition governments all over Europe. And here it is, the one of the, the biggest European country in Germany, uh, the two biggest parties are, 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 are and have, which have long-standing historical differences are joining in coalition. So they could have saved themselves in 2015, but they didn't have the um, foresight and vision to make the difference. But then they did they, 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 APNO and AFC come together, they call it, it would have been too late for them to... No, uh, they start, the, as soon as 2011 happened. Okay, okay, you're talking after 2011. As, as soon as 2011 happened, the PVP should then should have then begun to strategize as to how to win 2015. What the strategizing in 2011 did was to how to get through how to pass legislation in parliament, how to run the government. That wasn't the issue. You couldn't run the government. They ex it, it, it's, it's amazing to me that the PVP expected the opposition to cooperate in aiding them to run the government. That doesn't happen anywhere in politics. Where, where does that happen? So the, the, the strategy ought to have been, how do we win in 2015? Whether a new candidate, whether a new argument, whether new policies, whether to build a coalition. And the simplest answer was to prevent the coalition between APNU and AFC, and the way to prevent that coalition was to bring in the AFC into, onto the side of the PPP. Um, I don't think we asked you the last time, and I don't know why we didn't ask you, but I don't think anyone should interview you without asking you your opinion on the Ramatar presidency. Donald tried, but, <laughs> but the foundation wasn't there. Donald... Donald Ram, pre, former President Ramatar is not is not supportive of a coalition approach to politics in Guyana. So he had immediately that was a a a, a, a blockage. Now there's nothing wrong with, with his brain, there's nothing wrong with his capacity. Uh, he could have done better but he could not do better with what he had. He didn't have any room to maneuver. He didn't have any, any policies that he could have promoted with a parliament in which he did not have the majority. And the answer to that problem is to find the majority. The, APNO was not cooperating in anything. Uh, and he, he has said so time and again on this program and others. APNO was not cooperating, but why would you expect them to cooperate? Why would they cooperate? Mm. I, there's several things that come out of this conversation, and it's pretty interesting. I think one of the things that I don't hear often, um, Freddie and Mr. Ramgran, is the role of the media in 2011 and 2015 in, in the elections. And of course, I think Freddie would have spoken about it, uh, the intervention of the, the ABC countries uh, along the way. 
um, uh, put in pressure and so on. But it would be interesting for us to examine that because the role of the media was important. If you have a media harping on you, harping on you. The second thing is which um, I saw coming out from the PPP leaders, which uh, some of them did admit complacency was one of them. You know, we, we became complacent after 20 something years in, in government. And so there were several things that would have happened. And you were talking about the other side about the possible what they could have done to save it. I think the boat was already the for falls and it would have been pretty difficult. The good thing about it for the PPP from their side, which is what the PPP leaders have been saying, is that that 2015 to 2020 was a learning experience. They could have gotten themselves together and, you know, pulled themselves together. Um, which brings me to my next question that I want to ask you. Recently, President Irfan Ali um, and this whole thing with Nigel and Dan Lal, um, one expected to see the same old politics. However, after Nigel and Dan Lal was cleared, people expect him to go back. I heard that, to go back in office. And what we saw there was an acceptance of his uh, resignation, which uh, could, you could argue it both ways. Um, and the president could have very well said no, or they could have taken him back into the fold and said, go back, you've been cleared. But the president uh, said that he resigned. Your take on that situation? Yeah, you know, I had lots of discussion with friends and people interested in politics as to what was potentially likely to happen. And in relation to the possible, in relation to the case possibly collapsing along the way, the question is, what would the president do? If Darren Nall was not indicted for, the not charged for an offense, or if he charged, got off, what would the president do? My argument was that Guyana is a different country from 2011 to 2020, even from 2015 to 2020. Guyana is different because in 2020, the power of civil society has increased dramatically. Now, I know you criticize civil society quite a lot. I have my issues too. But the fact of the matter is that civil society has grown in influence. And the influence of civil society... Are you saying civil society and social media in the same breath or the difference? No, I'm talking about civil society. Okay. The, the power of civil society, the influence of civil society today would have prevented, in my argument, before the matter concluded, would have prevented President Ali from re-employing Dharmlal in the government in the event that he's is freed for whatever reason. And it, that, in fact, transpired. And we're looking at a slightly different country now, the, not slightly, a significantly different country now than what it was um, previously. And you do, a, you do a very good job in, <laughs> in um, you know, pointing out Civil, what civil society has, has, has uh, the neglect of civil society during the election period. And I hope some of them are. Ashamed. But how difficult, as a follow-up from that, how difficult would have been a situation which the PPP, I don't think within the PNC either, I've seen that. Uh, traditionally, you don't find them sanctioning or censoring one of their own. And this case here was so much in the limelight. Well, you but know, he, he was cleared for all intents and purposes. It had been happening, you know, look, Barry Ramsaran, Dr. Ramsaran, in, during the Ramatar presidency. Barry Ramsaran is a very popular person in the uh -huh. PPP. He is very much liked by almost everybody who knows him. Uh, but Donald Ramatar was forced to let him go when he had this incident with a, a, a lady by the name of Charlene Nagir. Yes, I remember that. He, he was hostile and rude and, and like threatened her and, and, and that kind of thing. I don't know exactly what he said. But there was, you, you began to see the emergence of the power of civil society in that incident. I, Donald 
and all of us, including Ramatar and Berry, are very close to each other. And there is no way that Ramatar would have easily come to the decision to let Berry Ramsaran go. He was forced to. But there's another side to the story, and Freddie, because we, we, before we move away from it, um, Darmlal, Nigel Darmlal, ain't no ordinary member of the PPP. The guy uh, here is a hell of an organizer within the PPP region, two of the different regions. So imagine the strategic or the decision being taken by a leader when something like that. Because very well, you could have taken the high road um, or you know, a, a road. There's a difference between Darmlal and Barry Ramsaran. Barry Ramsaran was a loved comrade. Dharamlal is not in that category. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. You want to expound on that? <laughs> Yo, well, Barry Ramsaran was, was in the PVP since he was a child. He was a, he was he was there from 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 everybody. Nobody remembers a P, nobody of our era remembers a PVP that did not have Barry Ramsaran in it. Um, I thought it was interesting, though, that, um, that the president accepted him uh, because party pressure could have very well seen him back in, in the, uh, as a minister. Uh, but however, it went that way. The last time you were here, after the program, I got about three calls from very well-known people, one of whom know you well. And this is what they said. It's what I'm talking about. That was in response to my question whether Burnham was a demonic leader. Your answer was, no, I think Burnham wanted power. Um, you still maintain that Burnham's uh, uh, modus operandi was acquisition of power, hogging it, etc. that there wasn't demonic sides to him? Yes, of course. I, don't, I, I won't call people names. I mean, to call person those kind of adjectives. I, 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 won't, I don't use those adjectives to describe people. Even tyrannical or tyrannical? No, but no I would say tyrannical. But I don't know that Burnham was a tyrannical person. People who, you don't get much out of the PNC, but if you do, Burnham sat in a meeting. He, he had regular meetings with his general counsel, and everybody was free to speak. Everybody was free to speak and speak critically. Bottom finally made the decision. In the Jagan uh, setting, everybody was free to speak and speak critically. But Jagan didn't make the decision. The decision was arrived at by consensus. And if there was, Jagan was in a minority, he either accepted or he fought like hell to gain a majority support. Burnham didn't do that. Burnham listened to everybody. Everybody had freedom of speech and then made a decision. So these were not tyrannical in that sense. The problem with Burnham is he wanted power and he rigged elections to get power and, and one thing led to another. Because you were not a democratic leader, people resisted. And in order to, 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 to maintain the power, you had to suppress the resistance. And some of it came to the physical uh, thing, like the assassination of Rodney. So it's not demonic in the, uh, you know, he's uh, not, if Burnham was not a demon, he was, he was actually a very nice man if you uh, were able to speak to him. The, the, um, there's something you said, and I don't know if you know, the impact it has had on Guyana's historiography and revisionist history. You wrote a little letter in the Kaicho News, but the contents of that letter has had and continue to have serious consequences for understanding contemporary Guyanese history. And I have used your letter, the contents of that letter, I think on more than four occasions till we look at the 70s, we look at WPA, and we look at Walter Rodney's revolutionary credentials. And let me tell our viewers, because we didn't go through this the last time, but this is history now unfolding, and that's why it's so important to have people like you. You said in a letter, and I think you need, and other people need to seriously internalize what was said in that letter. You said, um, you were talking about the 
PPP and the PNC leadership meeting quite often at Gimpex building in Regent Street. When Dr. Jagan is not there, or Walter Watney is not there, I think it's Clive Thomas for the WP and you for the PPP. And the WP was planning this um, rebellion, this resistance in 1979 that the WP believe would have led to uh, a cataclysmic up upheaval in power, probably expecting Burnham to be toppled. And you said in that letter, when you approach Clive Thomas, because Rodney was not there at the meeting, neither uh, uh, Chetty, and you said, well, could you tell us about what's going on? What's how this thing is going to unfold, what you're planning? You said, you, you or the Thomas said, no, no, no. We want people to guess. We want people to guess what is going to happen. But surely, Ralph, if you planning a resistance against a government, your partner is one of the major, major um, revolutionary mass-based party in the world, not only in the Caribbean, a long-standing party with tremendous support in the country and a globally respected leader. And you're going to tell that party, no, we want you to guess? Um, isn't that an indictment of the WPA, Rodney, and the failure of the 70s? It was an indictment of the WPA because the WPA was hasty. They had leaders who, um, I, I can't say they were not experienced leaders. Rodney was a very experienced, though, though, though still a young man, he was a very experienced leader. had been active in politics since, since you know, his early 20s um, and had spent time in various jurisdictions in Jamaica, he knew from Guyana of course, then he was in Jamaica, he was in the UK, he was studying in the UK but he was still interested in politics, then he was in Tanzania for two periods. In Tanzania he had lots of conferences and uh, all over Africa and that kind of thing. So Clive Thomas was a very experienced leader but they, they Jagan had a, an understanding of the Guyanese reality that I think they didn't have. And his fundamental understanding of the Guyanese reality, uh, uh, people accuse him of, of, of not understanding, but his understanding of the Guyanese reality told him that we have to be very careful with attempts to overthrow the government one, because Barnum has the power, he will suppress, kill. And two, uh, to have an armed struggle meant that Guyana will have a civil war. Barnum will instigate a civil war. He will turn it into a civil war, even if people didn't want. Uh, the WPA became the revolutionary fervor went to excess when they saw the success, the burning of the building, Ministry of National Development, Ministry of Nas National Development, when they had the trade union movement began to get together, when they were able to, to build up resistance in the Linden area and get a lot of support when they were able to penetrate the army to some limited extent. I don't know what extent it was, but people say so. It was said that they were able to do so. Um, and I think they, they got carried away with the reality of these things, that these things meant that they would have been able to remove the government. But uh, the PP didn't see it that way. Chedi didn't see it that way. Chedi understood that international realities had to align first. You remember, Borno was very popular in the Narlene movement, you know. He's a Cuba. very popular third world leader. Yeah. Cuba was backing him, which was very, very important. Leftist leaders all over the world were backing him. So the, the, the international community was not aligned towards the removal of Borno. And that was a big big problem for the PPP. So these guys didn't see these things. I want to bring you back to that Damral situation because these are questions that are still on the table 
the DPP Shalimar Ali Hack, uh, based on what was forwarded to her by the police, subsequently gave a decision um, and the police acted on it. The virtual complainant or the, 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 the alleged victim doesn't want to proceed with the case against Mr. Damlal. Uh, the question that was on uh, that I saw many people asking, could the state have gone forward still? Yeah. That's one. Yes. And you would explain that. The second thing is, um, uh, are there any other scenarios where although the DPP would have uh, uh, given or rendered a decision or give her advice that the state went ahead? In this particular case, uh, uh, without a virtual complainant, uh, without an alleged victim testimony, um, how could they have proceeded forward? Well, the DPP said that there was some reason that, that she couldn't proceed with much. Some, I don't know what, some basis That's the initial state. didn't exist or something. I, I, I don't know what basis is that. There was a crime allegedly committed because the, the person wrote a statement. The statement was in the public domain. That is how we know. If this, if this statement that is in the public domain is in fact the statement that the, 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 the person gave, then a crime has been committed. On the basis of the fact that a crime has been committed, the DPP can make a charge. Now the person said, I don't want to proceed. Now if the DPP feels it's a waste of time, that you don't have a complainant, you're wasting state resources and, and all of that. Um, the DPP has the power to say, no, as she did. But the person could have been charged because, because there's evidence that a crime has been committed. And the person placed before the court and the complainant comes and says, um, I don't wish to proceed. Okay. Or I changed my mind. I now wish to proceed. Okay, well, there's some things that have not come out. And when Ganesh Mahi Paul was here, we managed to bring out a little bit of it. And I think this opportunity is offered to bring out some more. Um, and uh, I am not, I have to be careful how I, I, I say. The child was interviewed by three sets of actors the police, two NGOs and the Child Protection Agency. And she said, when the statement was read to her, she said some of it are not true. Now, when she was asked about anal sex, she did not know what the word anal meant. And the interviewer, I'm not going to say which of the three actors were interviewed now. She did not know when they asked her about anal sex. So she said, what was that? And then they explained to her what is anal sex. And she said, well, she said she did not say that in the statement. Wouldn't some of that weaken your case if you're going to proceed? Of course. It could very well be that that was one of the reasons the... the, the DPP said, please investigate further. I don't know. But um, if the statement that the young lady, young, we don't know what she t told the police. She may have told the police something different, but the police felt that whatever she told them was sufficient, sufficiently um, serious for the DPP to give her opinion on the matter, to give directions in the matter as to how to proceed. So whatever she told the police apparently constituted a serious allegation, serious enough for the police to refer the matter to the DPP for advice. Now the DPP did not say that the statement which you have supplied, sub, uh, submitted to me does not constitute a criminal offense. The DPP wouldn't say all of that. The DPP would say there is not sufficient evidence to charge. But the DPP said, investigate further. I what she meant by that, I don't know. Are you suggesting, Mr. Ramkaran, that at the level of the police, uh, Freddie, forgive me for that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. At the level of the police, they could have taken a decision and tell the, the alleged complaint, the, 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 the alleged victim 
that what you have just said to us or this thing here in hold it up it has no water could the police have taken a decision of, instead of sending it to the dpp no. are they obligated to no they're 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 not obligated to but in a serious matter of that nature not even if it does not involve the uh, 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 public figure uh in a matter of that nature all entitled matters all serious matters like that they sent to the dpp for advice but they're not obligated to um i don't know what if there's any law on it but i i think it normally happens mm -hmm. um they, they, they wouldn't charge a person with a serious offense an indictable offense without p passing it to the deep and that's indictable, um, right? that's indictable. you you i want to take you up on i am disagreeing with you now on the position you took with your latest piece in the conversation tree in which I think you were saying that the AFC offers something to the PNC and therefore the, it's to the PNC loss that the AFC went its own way. But the A, if the PNC had persisted with the AFC, the AFC had to, and if they reach out to the AFC again, now, the AFC has to bring something to the table. I'm asking you, what could the AFC had brought to the table if it didn't divorce from the PNC? And if the marriage reoccurs, what could the AFC bring to the table? They do not bring a tremendous amount now because the AFC has lost out. Um, because Ram Ramzatan predicted quite accurately dead meat. that, that uh, they'd be dead meat if they joined the PNC, which in fact happened. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, in, within the PVP, there was always the question, what does the WPA bring to the PVP? That occurred for a long time after the elections, that the WPA doesn't bring anything to the PVP. But the, the WPA, Chedi has always argued, the WPA brings something to the PVP. They bring a vision. They are African-oriented in leadership. So that is one. They are many intellectuals and academics in the WPA that the PVP does not have. That's a second thing. So similarly, the AFC brings, they bring an Indian leadership, Ramjatan. They bring some other Indian people around. Um, they bring a different set of people who are not PNC, who, who, not, who do not have a history of being PNC, Cathy Hughes, Patterson and all of these people. They bring bring all of these people. It not, may not be much, but a coalition to the public sends a message that we're united in opposition to the PPP. We're united and we have a variety of views which are placed on the table and out of those views we have a united picture. Um, I don't know if you've read the latest book by, um, the latest book on Guyanese politics by Raphael Trotman. In that book, he said, it's unfortunate that Granger didn't go on. Uh, the people didn't understand the great changes that he had in, 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 in store. What great changes as an astute experience politician? What great changes Trotman talking about? Well, I, I don't know what great changes he could have meant. There was, uh, there was nothing to indicate what changes he had in mind. I mean, the agreement with Exxon was an agreement that has come under a great deal of criticism. Um, the, um, I, I could not understand his, um, his, his climate change proposals were, you know, nothing of, of, of substance. I don't know what great your, your take on Granger. He was there for five years. It was a nice man, a pleasant but your political oh. take. <laughs> <laughs> Granger had been out of polit out of high level politics for a very long time. And um I think that was a problem for him. I don't think he had the experience. I don't I'm not saying he was not an experienced man. I'm saying he didn't have the experience in high-level politics. He didn't have the capacity to maneuver. He was um, 
He just didn't have it. I heard I heard a lot of stuff coming on to the latter part of the 2020 coming on to the elections and especially during the elections as to uh, uh, Mr. Green's grip as a president on his uh, on the coalition and what I was told that uh, so they very early on I think uh, even within the cabinet uh, or with at the level where where do they make the decisions on the contract um there were some subcommittees and apparently uh, that was hijacked that was the first thing that really happened the second thing is the the, the thing become like a capitalist system that was one of the argument and that uh, some of the ministers just decided to do their own thing and then mr green just sitting there as the chair for the cabinet and what did you do today what did you do today eventually lost script because those guys instead of he dictated they come and tell him this is what we do in them so it wasn't I think his lack of micromanagement is weird, and then coming on to the 2020 part with the elections, and I think there was a couple of minutes who, who basically um, on the boat, they decide to, to, how you say, treason against him. Um, we heard stories about some female ministers and so on, literally threatening the man, um, that what the hell are you doing? Um, and I think that was, One I, I the- probably agree with Mr. Ramker, and that he probably was a nice person, but as a president, out of touch with reality, that was uh, something that I was hearing. Not- do you do you believe, Mr. Ramkaran, that Joe Harmon was running the show and not um, Granger? He was no. I don't believe that. He was only running the show to the extent that Granger allowed him. So similar to lunch, huh? They were running the show only to the extent that they were allowed to. So I, I don't know what the internal situation was, but if, if Granger was not a hands-on president, then Harmon would have had a great deal of um, of, of leeway, of opportunity. Luncheon was, Jack Day was a hands-on president, but Luncheon created his own, um, his own mandates all around the public service and so on. So Luncheon had this, and which Jagde allowed him to do, even though Jagde was a hands-on person. So I, I, it depends on, on I, Granger was not a hands-on person. Granger said to himself, he allowed the city council to to um, carry on with this um, parking meter stuff because he said, I don't want to intervene in anybody's business. Now, you don't intervene in anybody's business. If I'm running an organization, like a government, you have a plan for the government. And each minister has a plan for the five years. And that plan for the five years is has to be broken down for a year and has to be broken down for six months and has to be broken down for three months. That is what I would insist my ministers to do. And then I meet my ministers once a month or something. Let me hear your, your three months or six month plan. How is it going? What problems are you having? Is there any help you need? Or are you on target? I don't know. I, I, I think this way the system fell through because if the ministers came up with their own thing and, and without him having a full understanding of what is really there and his advisor telling him and everybody. And <laughs> I met Edge Hill. Is, I met the minister, the minister Edge, Hill? Edge Hill at the f- Ashton Chase's funeral and we greeted each other. Now, they're building a road by me in Bel Air from conversation yeah, to yeah, going yeah. right down to Campbellville. And I don't want to complain to anybody because I know these contracts take time and over, they are overextended. But it's clear to me that it's behind schedule. He came up to me, how were you and so on? And then he mentioned the contract. He said, that place by you, you know, they're... Um, They're over the time, and I'll be speaking to them shortly about it. Now, that is what I would like to see in a minister. That is what I would like to see Granger doing. Granger, I'm sorry, John Deo does that. I presume Irfan Ali does that, President Ali, Vice President John Deo. Um I don't know if Granger did that kind of stuff. Your, your, your latest piece, it doesn't uh, in your in your latest piece in compensation tree, you don't paint a glorious future for the PNC. If our money keeps coming in, 
Look, I think you experience enough to know that this gruntle population is unlikely to emerge if the pie is there to be shared. You create revolution when people are hungry, people are starving, people are facing brutality. But if you have if you have an industry that is on world demand and money is coming in, then an opposition will have a hard time to exist. Because unless you have a very stupid government, why would they have the money and not share it around? And I am seeing some level of, of proper, uh, uh, of decent spending that is reaching out to the various sections of the population. If you have such a scenario, the PNC has to reshape its politics. It, it does have to reshape its politics. And, and the only future for Guyana is a future in where, where the two parties are in a form of collaboration and cooperation. Look, if, if, if the government were to do more, I don't think they're doing enough, but they might be doing enough, I don't know. But to the outsider, I'm an outsider, I don't believe that they're doing enough. But if they were to do enough to build a, an African business class and middle class. African people have traditionally not gone into business for whatever reasons. And it was made worse during the 70s and 80s. What Barnum did was to take over the economy and place black managers, African managers, not exclusively, but predominantly African managers to run the, these structures. So African leadership went into the bureaucracy. That is why you hear this, you heard this talk at that time of the bureau, uh, bureaucratic bourgeoisie. They went into the bureaucracy and not into business. So the PNC took their African support, the, the intellectual, academic, uh, experts and so on, and had them in the bureaucracy. So they, they did not flourish in business. That is one of the reasons you see, people can say, well, all Indians are getting the job because the, the contracts and procurement and so on, because Indians are the people who are bidding. Indians are the people who are putting out the, um, the, the bids for these things. But if the people were to be spending more time taking away the African bourgeoisie from the PNC, they'd be in very serious trouble. Very, um, very serious trouble. Our time is going. Before we get back to Ms. Ankran, um, this book is entitled Army Intervention in the 1973 Elections in Guyana. In this book, it was described how the soldiers killed two PPP supporters trying to stop the hijacking of the ballot boxes. The two men that were killed were 17-year-old Jagan Parmesal and Bolonard Parmanand. Tomorrow evening at 8.30, we have a special edition of the Gildari Fadikisun show in which his children, Parmanand, um, Bolonard Parmanand children came last Sunday for the 50th anniversary of his death. And they will be in the studio tomorrow evening. One daughter and two sons, they will be talking about the murder of their father when they were very small and how they reached the age that they are right now, what they experienced, how they felt, how they missed him, and how they, who took care of them and how they reached the stage that they reached. This book is not for the faint-hearted. Army intervention in the 1973 election in Guyana, written by Mr. Janet Jagan, and at that time our guests would have been top a top leader in the PPP at that time. So tomorrow evening, 8.30, special edition of the Gildari Freddy Kisun show. Back to Leonard Gildari and our guest, Mr. Ramkaran. Um, interesting point to raise there by Mr. Ramkaran uh, with regards to uh, how they need to do it. But I didn't hear, I, I think, I'm not sure whether I hear you in your closing remarks. I, I, that would have been one of my questions. What is the formula? How are they going to do it? Because they're in almost every every village, um, Afro-Guyanese village, Maka, um, uh, Buxton, 
what is the formula if the people traditionally they didn't gonna shift it's just once it uh, that, that they won the 2020 elections by there's a pvp how would they give was a formula for them to really go after the afro guyanese they, they, they wouldn't here. not for they wouldn't get for the foreseeable future they will not get Af, afro guy african guyanese support for any um, to any considerable extent um um Aubrey Norton runs the danger of losing the African middle class support as Corbyn did in 2006. Corbyn lost that support. And he lost, he five, lost seats. five seats. And those five seats went to the AFC. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no AFC today. So if there is, a, if Norton loses that support again, they will stay home. They're not going to vote for the P PPP. Um, the PPP has no hope of in, in of gaining large scale African support. That can only come with a, a, a collaboration between the APNU and the PPP at, at, at some stage. But the PPP can shave off enough to keep a beer majority going, to keep a beer majority going for a considerable time. So, but yeah. the PPP has to understand that people get tired of People get tired of of, of, of one long party, serving, of one, party one party rule after a while. So um, before we go, I know time is going. You advocated and the abolition of the jury system, and you list countries in this one. But I'm asking you now, if there is amendment to the law to do away with jury system, it can't be one judge. It can be. It has to be a panel of judge trying those cases. Well, you have various methods. You have you have a panel of judges. You have one judge. You have a panel of judges. You have a judge and two um, laymen, civil, civil and lay persons. Because don't we run the risk of one judge? That person could be biased. They there, could be there, mentally there, unstable. There, yeah, there is. There, there is. There is. You you do run the risk of one judge with one judge. Okay, good morning. Interesting and interesting night. As always, it's been a pleasure talking to Mr. Ralph Ramgren. Uh, he has uh, so much knowledge, um, uh, institutional knowledge in this country's affairs, whether it's politics and the legal side of things, and of course, he has his own opinions. Is he still at page 40 in his memoir? <laughs> yes, that's for the last time. Yeah. You've got to go on. It's, 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 got, to more more. it's got to be more. You were here almost a year ago. I tried, to, re I tried to retire. I try to retire from legal practice, and if I do so, I'll have some more time to spend. But uh, the partners in my firm are are do, would not allow me to retire, so I still work. And as a result of my work, the forty you know, pages haven't I, moved. They have not moved. Well, the good thing about it is that uh, regardless what happened, it's very, very sharp. And this is, uh, he's one of Guyana's, um, how, how you say it, historians, um, institutional knowledge, and that's very good. And it's good that we should also, uh, we have the opportunity um, to reach out to him and sit down and listen to some of the things that he has to say. Don't have to agree with it, but that's the beauty of this country. Um, we agree to disagree, and we should listen to the other views as well. Wherever you are, whatever it is that you're doing, I want to say thank you very much to uh, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, and of course my co-host Freddy Kisun, and I thank you for joining us as usual uh, this evening. I hope that you've enjoyed it, you've learned a lot. We're going to be back with you on Wednesday evening. Special edition, dear. Look up for that. You should. Special edition is tomorrow. No, there's another special edition. Oh, there. Anytime you have Freddie Kisun in the house, it's a special edition. <laughs> Good night, folks. Stay safe on the roadways. Yeah.